And so I want to talk about communication avoiding algorithms. But before I tell you about avoiding communication, I have to tell you what communication is. And you're pretty familiar with it. We've been talking about it all day. But just to be, I want to have a formal model so I can prove my algorithms are actually optimal. So my algorithms are going to have two costs, measured in either time or energy. I care about both. The arithmetic flops and moving data. That could be between different levels of a memory hierarchy, and there could be multiple levels, or between different processors over a network. So here's my formal model I'm going to use to say whether an algorithm is optimal or not, or not. I'll count how many flops it does. I'll count how many words it moves over any one of those wires in the previous slide. And I'll count the number of messages, the number of you know, packets of contiguous words that I send over it. Those all depend on my algorithm. And then there are the hardware parameters, the time per flop, the time per word moved or the reciprocal bandwidth, and the time per message or the latency. The last two are the communication. And as we're all pretty familiar with in this audience, those three hardware parameters are orders of magnitude apart. The time per flop is much less than to send a word, which is much less than the latency. And they're growing apart exponentially over time. This is a little bit old data, but let's just say that it used to be Moore's Law, end of Denard scaling and all that. But now multi-core is making the time per flop get better every year. And, but, and everything else is getting better too, but much, much more slowly. So what that means is that even if your algorithm is not dominated by communication this year, it may be next year or the year after that. So we want to avoid communication to save time. And I should say it's entirely the same story for energy. If I were to change all of these things to ergs or joules per flop, joules per word moved, or joules per latency per message, it would all be the same story. So we want to do that as well. So what are my goals today? I want to redesign algorithms to avoid communication to avoid, and that means between all different levels of the memory hierarchy, between you know, L2 and DRAM, and over the network. And what I'd also like to do is, whenever possible, attain provable lower bounds. And so what I'm going to do is tell you about some lower bounds on algorithms, uh, eventually a very, very broad category of algorithms, and say that the current uh, versions of how we do very standard things, even matrix multiplier, are often far above the lower bounds and so that large speed ups and energy savings are possible. So let me give you an advertising slide of some of the speed ups we attain by using our new algorithms. So for example, there's a way to do matrix multiply which was 12 times faster than the previous best known method. It's kind of surprising that something as well studied as matrix multiply, and here I mean the usual n cubed algorithm, you know, has had a factor of 12 lying on the table. Tensor contractions, which come up in computational chemistry all the time, same idea applies, three times faster. It doesn't have to be floating point. It can be a graph algorithm. It can be all pairs shortest path. Turns out that smells like three nested loops in, in matrix multiply, so a lot of the same tricks apply to that. Uh, Gaussian elimination, uh, we, we got speed ups using the same ideas of 2x. Uh, the direct end body code, almost 12x again. Tall skinny QR, that's a, the QR decomposition of a matrix with many more rows and columns. Also much faster eigenvalue problems. You know, we do look at matrix multiplies besides the usual n cubed ones. But also we've looked at iterative methods. And so this is the mini GMG benchmark. And in particular, it's used the bottom solver in that mini GMG benchmark is something called uh, by CG stab, which is a Krilov subspace method. And we made that go much, much faster, which made the entire uh, GMG benchmark go faster, and that applies to combustion simulation. And we've recently extended this to lots of machine learning algorithms, things like uh, anything that smells like a SGD, a, a stochastic gradient descent, and so forth. So for example, Lasso is a well-known L1 minimization algorithm, and all the ideas apply there too. So just to give you some idea of the recognition, the tall skinny QR algorithm won a best paper prize a few years ago when we finally got into the LAPAC library, which we we're responsible for. And a few years ago, I was teaching this matrix multiply algorithm in my parallel computing class. And one of the students in the class thought it was a good idea. So he did a startup. And it was called Nirvana and was acquired by Intel a couple of years ago. So, uh, so these ideas are having their impact. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to give you a survey of the state of the art of communication avoiding algorithms. And I'll review the previous matrix multiply algorithm so we know, you know where things got started. Then I'll tell you the idea between to get the 12x speed up, and I'm calling it two and a half dimensional matrix multiply. Then I'll tell you about tall skinny QR, and then I'll mention you know, Strassen very, very briefly. What we've recently discovered is all these ideas extend to arbitrary code 
that looks like nested loops accessing arrays. And the arrays can have any subscripts you want, as long as they're you know, some linear combinations of the loop indices, like i plus 3j, whatever you want. So all these ideas, we can find lower bounds and optimal algorithms for any code that looks like that, which is most code. And I'll, uh, two examples I'll give you there are n-body code and neural nets. Then you can forget everything I've said. We'll move on to a new topic, which is Krilov subspace methods. And I'll do a whole you know, description of how to get optimal versions of all your favorite Krilov subspace methods. And the same things that apply to machine learning. And then in the third hour of my talk, I'll, there are a few related topics. OK. So here's the state of the art of communication avoiding linear algebra. So let me talk about direct linear algebra first. I'm going to show you lower bounds in the communication for anything that you think of as linear algebra, not just matrix multiply, but solving systems of linear equations, least squares, eigenvalue problems, the SVD, and so forth. And that means lower bounds both on you know, memory traffic, DRAM to cache, or between processors over a network. Now, once you have the lower bounds, what you do, naturally, is you compare it to the algorithms and standard libraries. And all the standard libraries, like in LAPAC, which we're also responsible for, ScalaPAC, you know, it was asymptotically more communication. So we've been uh, working hard on trying to get new software into these libraries. That's a software production is a much longer process. They're not all there yet. But as you've seen, we've gotten uh, large speed ups possible. I should say the theory tells you roughly what the algorithm looks like. It doesn't tell you every last constant. And so there is still some auto tuning required to get all the details right. But we sort of give you the right design space for these optimal algorithms. So that's direct linear algebra. And let me just say ditto for iterative linear algebra. So let me tell you what the lower bound is for direct linear algebra. And this is for anything that smells like three nested loops. All right? So I'll give you a formal mathematical definition of smells like three nested loops but later. But your intuition is perfectly good right now. And so this is you know, n-cube like linear algebra. So just imagine two levels of, of memory, uh, DRAM where everything fits, and then a small fast memory of size capital M, which is too small to fit all the data. So what I want is a lower bound on how much data I have to move in between the big memory where everything fits and the small cache of size capital M in order to do the work. And the answer is, as long as it smells like three nested loops, you have to move at least this number of words. It's the total number of flops that you do divided by the square root of the fast memory size. No matter how you organize it, that's the lower bound. Now, I say this is in, and, and, and so this does not you know, have to be n cubed, it could be you know, something else. If you're doing a sparse matrix, it's the same lower bound. Now, in the parallel case, um, I, ha I have to make an assumption here, because in the parallel case, I just assume it's either load balanced or memory balanced. In that case, the number of flops is you know, n cubed divided by the number of processors or something like that. That's how you interpret it. Now, this has actually been known for a very long time. It was first proven back in 1981 by Hong and Kung for uh, sequential matrix multiply. And then later, it was extended to uh, the parallel case. But now we know it holds for anything that smells like three nested loops. All the blahs, LU, QR, eigenvalue problems, SVD, tensor contractions. Of course, you can have tensors of arbitrary dimensions and arbitrary nested loops, but they still smell like three nested loops in this mathematical sense, and it all works for them. It applies not just to single subroutine calls. It can apply to whole programs where you interleave these operations. So for example, if I want to compute a product, a, a power of a matrix by doing multiple matrix multiplies, the theory says that no matter how you interleave all of those matrix multiplies with one another, it's still the same lower bound. It applies to both dense and sparse linear algebra. So the number of flops doesn't have to be n cubed. It can be whatever you do with your sparse matrix. Now, of course, if you're multiplying two diagonal matrices, there's no magic there that you can do better than the obvious algorithm. So whether this is attainable or not will depend on the sparse matri sparsity structure. I'll talk about that. It applies in the sequential and parallel case. And you don't have to do multiplies and adds in the inner loop. You could be doing other things. All I care about what is what data I'm accessing. So for example, the floyd warshall all pair shortest path algorithm looks like three nested loops where I'm doing maxes and, and sums, and that's good enough. So that's the lower bound on the number of words moved. I also want to lower bound the latency. And so here's sort of the simplest possible lower bound. Imagine I take all these words, and I pack each of them into the largest possible message. That would minimize the number of messages. What's the largest possible message? The whole memory. So I'm just going to divide this bound by capital M, 
And that's my target lower bound. It's just a factor of m smaller than that one. And again, that is you know, achievable for a lot of these things. And I'm pleased to say this analysis also won a uh, best paper prize. So once we figured out these lower bounds, because that was the first thing we did, we asked ourselves, OK, are we done? You know, is LA pack and scale pack good enough? And they were typically not. They typically did asymptotically more communication than was necessary. And so we began, as I said, discovering lots of other new algorithms that did attain the lower bounds. In the case of matrix multiply, it was simply, OK, we're going to do the same n cubed operations, but we're going to do them in a different order and you know, do the loads and stores differently and all that. But for a lot of other algorithms, for example, like Gaussian elimination, we had to change the numerical algorithm. We had to abandon partial pivoting. Of course, you have to pivot to get the right answer, but there's a different kind of pivoting that attains the lower bound, and you can, there's a different proof that it's still numerically stable. Uh, for QR, I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, you have to use a different, actually, uh, representation of the, of the answer with a new data structure. But it's still a Q, just it's represented differently. So it's not just doing things in a different order. Now, as I mentioned, for sparse cases, it depends on the sparsity structure. Multiplying two diagonal matrices, no magic. So let me give you some examples where there are interesting sparsity structures where you can hit the lower bounds. So if you have sparse Koleski of a matrix with large separators, so think a finite element matrix you know, or a 2D mesh or a 3D mesh. That's, you know, if you've heard about what separators are, it applies there. Those are matrices where you have big enough dense blocks that if you get the dense blocks right, then everything works. Another example that was kind of just for theory and for fun, you take two matrices in each entry, you just flip a coin. Is it zero or not? And you know, with some probability, in that case, you can prove the lower bound. But a more interesting practical one that uh, uh, Kathy Yellick and, and Penn, her student, Penn Porn Coentacool, just did, is that they worked on multiplying sparse times dense matrices. Where does this come up? It comes up in a lot of machine learning problems. They were doing it for an fMRI application. And there they got 100x speed ups over the previous best algorithm. So there's still lots of work in progress in all of this. So here's, that was an overview. So now I'm going to go back and talk about uh, dense matrix multiplier. Are there any questions, though, before I go on? OK, here are the naive three nested loops that you can write down to multiply uh, two matrices, A times B plus C. So I loop from I equal uh, J and, and K to 1 to N. And the inner loop loops over K, and I'm taking the dot product, the ith row of A and the jth column of B, and computing the, uh, that entry of C. So now let me annotate the code by saying what data has to move between assuming, you know, let's say, DRAM and cache. So what I'm going to do is when I get to this point, I'm going to read that whole row of A into fast memory. So I'm going to assume my cache is big enough to hold a whole, whole row or column, but not the whole matrix. Then I, in the next loop, I read that entry of C. Then I have to read that column of B. And then the inner loop, which does the dot product, it's all in, in cache, and I just do it. So, and then when I'm done, I finally write C back to uh, slow memory. So what's the total count of movement? Well, I read each row of A exactly once. I keep it in memory until I'm done with it and throw it away. So that's n squared. Can't do better than that. I read and write each entry of C exactly once. Can't do better than that. But I have to read each column of B n times because I have to take its dot product with each row of A. So the entire matrix B is read n cubed times. And that's sort of where all the cost goes. Because I, I, I'm assuming I don't have enough room to keep the whole matrix in, in fast memory. So this is you know, n cubed reads and writes, and that totally dominates the n cubed arithmetic because you know, it's just much more expensive. So the question is, how do we fix that? And here is the very well known, known for a very long time, way to fix it. I'm going to use a tiled operation. So now the picture here is each of these little squares is not a single entry of the matrix. It's a little b by b block. And b is a parameter I get to pick. So I'm still going to have three nested loops, but, but I'm going to loop over all the blocks. And there are n over b blocks in each dimension. So I'm going to read this block into, into fast memory. So I assume that little b by b block fits in fast memory. So b can't be too big. I'll read in that block, read in that block. And then the innermost loop is three more nested loops that are doing a b by b matrix multiply of that block times that block gets added to that block. So I'm assuming three b squared fits in the cache. So under that assumption, then I'm going to read C exactly once and write it exactly once. Can't do better than that. Each block of A will be read 
n over b the quantity cubed times, and you can see I'm not doing n cubed reads anymore. It's n cubed divided by b. So I've made an improvement by this tuning parameter of b. And so it can be b times faster than the previ previous algorithm, assuming that the communication cost was dominant. OK, so does this attain the lower bound? So my assumption was that I have to have three of these b by b blocks fit into the fast memory. And then I get n cubed over b. So I want to make b as big as possible. So how big is b going to be? It's going to be about the square root of m. And so the number of reads and writes using this approach is going to be about n cubed divided by the square root of m. And that attains the lower bound. So this has been known for a long time. But now, as a practical person, you might say, well, what if I don't know m, right? I'm trying to write code that runs in any machine. And I don't have just have two levels of memory. I might have multiple levels of memory. So if, if I use the same trick and I had three levels of memory, I'd have to have not six nested loops, but nine nested loops. And let's just say people understand how to do this. You just write something called a cache oblivious algorithm, and which is sort of recursive. And then asymptotically, it all works. On the other hand, if you work for Intel and you're part of the MKL team, you write all those nested loops, because then you can really get every last constant and go very, very fast. But in principle, you can hit the lower bound. So that's the sequential case. I want to go on to the parallel case now, which is where there was something new. Any questions? So here, just a quick review, is the well-known for a long time and what we thought was optimal algorithm for multiplying uh, two uh, n by n matrices on p processors. So in this case, suppose I have 16 processors. They're arranged in a 4 by 4 grid. And each processor is going to own here that little square that's an n over 4 by n over 4 submatrix. So that's the way I'm laying out the data across all the processors. And so what does the SUMA algorithm do? SUMA stands for Scalable Universal Matrix Multiply Algorithm, just a convenient acronym. And so at each step of the algorithm, what I'm going to do is at each, I'm going to break my, uh, my matrix up into block columns and block rows. So that's going to be, let's say, b columns wide. And then each processor is going to own, in a column, is going to own a little n over 4 by b submatrix. And it's going to broadcast it, MPI broadcast, sideways so that everybody, all the processors in its processor row, owns that copy of the red column. Everybody in the blue row is going to broadcast it down. So I actually have four down broadcasts going and, and four sideways broadcasts going. So every processor is going to receive a blue submatrix from a neighbor in the column, a red submatrix from a neighbor in the row. It'll receive them and multiply them and add them to the local submatrix. And it'll just do that, and it'll, it'll accumulate all the processors, all, all the dot products that you need. And there's the code if you want to read it. So ah, why is this falling off the top? Sorry about that. So um, what I'd like to say is, does this attain the lower bound? And so here, let me, let me remind you what the lower bound is. So I'm multiplying two n by n matrices on p processors. And remember, I had the square root of m in my denominator. So what is m here? Well, let me just assume I have one copy of all the data. That's a perfectly reasonable assumption. So everybody's going to get one pth of all the data. So that's the n squared over p goes in the denominator. And the numerator was the number of flops, n cubed over p. Plug that in, I get n squared over the square root of p. And if you do all the counting carefully on, of the sum algorithm, you hit that lower bound. And if you count the number of messages, it's a factor of m lower. And again, you hit the lower bound. The number of messages is the square root of p. So this was, so we realized, OK, SUMA looks like it's optimal. And then we asked whether scale pack hit those lower bounds. And it turns out that for the number of words moved, it mostly did, except for solving the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. But for the number of messages sent for square root of p, it was asymptotically worse in almost all cases, except for Koleski. And so we got ourselves busy, and we uh, invented new algorithms for all of these things that hit both the lower bounds in both the number of messages and the number of words moved. I should say for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem, we don't have an algorithm other than a randomized algorithm that does it. It's the only way it does it. So randomized linear algebra is the only way to go there. And then for a little while, we thought we were done. And then we asked, can we do better? Can we do better than that supposed lower bound? Now, didn't I just tell you we were already optimal? Well, I had an assumption, which was that the m in the denominator was, you know, you know, I, I couldn't make it any bigger, that I only used the least amount of memory possible. But the lower bound remains true even if you make the, if, if you have more memory. So I can make it smaller. 
And so can we attain it? And it turns out that if you look at the literature, there was a special case of this that was known for a long time. And the name for it was three-dimensional matrix multiply, 3D matrix multiply. And it happened to use this magic amount of extra memory. Instead of n squared over p, it was n squared over p to the 2 thirds. And it was reinvented many times in the literature. But obviously, we don't always have p to the 1 third times as much memory available. You know, p is 1,000, right? You need 10 times more memory. So that led us to say, can we always attain this lower bound, even if we only have a little bit of extra memory? And that's something called communication avoiding 2 and a half dimensional matrix multiply. So here's how the algorithm works. So let's suppose I have room for C copies of the data. C is a parameter, de depends on how much data you have. So every processor can fit C n squared over P. What am I going to do? I'm going to take my P processors and arrange them in this two and a half dimensional grid of processors. So they're going to be C layers, where C is the number of copies of the data. Each layer will have P over C processors arranged in a square grid. So in this particular case, I have room for two copies of the data and I have two layers of 16 processors each. And so let me just, to write down the algorithm very briefly, I'm going to use i, j, and k to you know, count which processor I'm at. And initially, I'll assume that all the data is sitting in the top. So that processor owns a little n over 4 by n over 4 submatrix of both the input matrices. So question? What do you mean by 2 point? Well, so, so, so the two-dimensional algorithm was summa, right? I had, a, I had a square grid of processors. That's the two-dimensional algorithm. The three-dimensional algorithm assumed I had a cube of processors, cube root of p by cube root of p by cube root of p. And this, two and a half dimensional, interpolates between them. So it has summa as a special case, and it has 3D as a special case. That's the, the reason for the name. OK, so what's the algorithm? In three lines, it does this. Each processor who owns a submatrix broadcasts it down. So I have a copy at each level. So that's a very simple vertical broadcast. Then each layer runs one seeth of the summa algorithm. In this case, it runs one half of the summa algorithm and computes one half of all the partial sums in your matrix multiply. And the third step is I take all the partial sums sitting on top of one another, and I do a vertical reduction, and the answer appears on the top. So obviously, I'm skipping a lot of details, but that's the basic algorithm. And so the question is, how much does this help? As I mentioned, we get up to 12x speedups by doing it this way. So here's some performance data on a uh, 16,000 node, 64,000 core IBM BGP for a small matrix multiply, 8K by 8K, and then for a larger matrix multiply. The vertical axis is percentage of machine peak up to 100, so up is good. And so you can see that when I use the classic algorithm, one copy of the data, it's totally, you know, it's this, it, I'm getting like 4 or 5% of peak. And when I do it with this new trick, I get more like 25% of peak. I'll do a timing breakdown in the next slide. This is just speed up. When I do it in the larger case, I only get a 2.7x speed up, but I go from, you know, 30% of peak to, you know, 75% of peak. So now, let me show you some more performance data of where these speed ups came from. So now, the um, vertical axis is the execution time. So down is good. And it's normalized by the two-dimensional algorithm with one copy of the data. And the red is the time spent communicating. The blue is time spent idle, just waiting for stuff to arrive. And the green is actually useful flops. And so I reduced the communication from this big red bar to this tiny little red bar here that's 95% less. The, almost all the weighting went away, too. That's because this algorithm fits perfectly on a three-dimensional torus. And, and it was carefully orchestrated to use all the wires in the torus at the same time. And even the flops went faster. But I'm still doing the same n cube flops. Anybody have an idea why the n cube flops could have possibly gone faster? It's because the local memory, the local matrices in which I called the local DGEMs were larger. So I got better cache performance in each processor. And that's why the flop time went down, too. Here's the bigger matrix multiply. I still got rid of, you know, 95% of the communication, but now the flops was a big, it was about a third of it, and so I only got, you know, a factor of 2.7x speed up. But if moving data was where all your energy went, I still may have saved you a large fraction of all your energy, so it was still worth doing all that. And I'm pleased to say this won another best paper prize. <laughs> okay, so let me say this algorithm has a very nice property. It achieves perfect strong scaling in both time and energy. So let me tell you what perfect strong scaling means. 
So every time you add a processor, you know, you're trying to scale up your problem, you have a fixed matrix size, that's what strong scaling is, you want to increase the number of processors, you're not just getting an extra hardware resource consisting of a CPU, you're getting the extra memory. And you're paying for it, so you should use all that memory too. So let me start, and I'm going to write down a formula for this. Let me assume that I start with the minimal number of processors, P, needed to fit all three matrices, A, B, and C. Okay? And I'm going to increase the number of processors by a factor of C, and that's going to increase the total memory by a factor of C. And I want to know how much faster I go by using that algorithm, knowing that I have that extra memory. So just for a little notation, I'm going to have the, this is the alpha beta model that uh, uh, Bill mentioned earlier. So, uh, but now I'm going to count the seconds per flop, the seconds per word moved, and the seconds per message. And here is a formula that you can write down, which is the time to solve the problem on C times P processors. And there are three terms that depend on the time per flop, uh, and the time per word moved, and the time per message. And I don't want you to read all the, the algebra, I just want you to see how it scales. And it scales perfectly. The, if I increase the number of processors by a factor of C, the flop time goes down by a factor of C, the bandwidth time goes down by a factor of C, and the latency goes down by a factor of C. So that's what I call perfect strong scaling in time. So now let me write down a similar formula for energy. So, I'm still, so now the subscript E means energy. So I'm going to count the joules per flop, the joules per word moved, and the joules per message. But of course, in a computer, you waste a lot of energy and other things besides that. The memory eats up a large amount of, of, of energy. So I'm going to count the joules per word moved, excuse me, the joules per word of memory just to keep the memory turned on per second. So that, that takes it. And then there's everything else, the leakage, the network, you know, the, cool, you know, the air conditioning. You know, let's just throw that into, into the, that other term. OK, so now I get an even longer, messier formula for how much energy it takes to solve the problem on C times P processors. And again, I don't want you to read it. It scales perfectly. It doesn't take any more energy to solve the problem C times faster than it did, did on the original number of processors. So that's what I call perfect strong scaling in energy. So how could that be? The idea is that I have C times as many processors. They're all burning power at the same rate, and, but they're only burning at one seeth as long. So the Cs cancel and it's the same amount of energy. So that's perfect strong scaling in energy. And it extends to lots of other algorithms too where you can attain this. And you might be asking, um, what about the network? I mean, can you actually attain this lower bound? We can actually extend our lower bounds to what your communication network should look like. So for example, to do this for linear algebra, you, you can't do it with a 2D torus. That turns out to be a bottleneck. But a 3D torus is good enough. So we can tell you exactly what your network topology looks like too. So let me just show you another slide with some performance data for Gaussian elimination for LU. And I'm going to show it to you both with and without pivoting. And without pivoting, uh, this trick also gets rid of a lot of the communication time, and we get a speed up of 2x. And if we do our new kinds of pivoting, I'm call it's not partial pivoting anymore. It's something else called communication avoiding pivoting. I don't have time to go into the details, but it, it's stable. It also gives you a nice speed up by getting rid of most of the communication time. And uh, it's possible to do this for QR and lots of other algorithms, too. Now, when we originally did this, we asked ourselves, OK, can we get perfect strong scaling for Gaussian elimination, too? Because we could make the latency go down. Excuse me, we could make the bandwidth go down by the factor you know, of C that we expected, but we couldn't make the latency go down. So we tried and tried, and we failed. So what do you do when you can't invent an, an algorithm? You prove a new lower bound that proves you are optimal anyway. So there's a new lower bound that just applies to algorithms like Gaussian elimination and QR, which have interesting dependency patterns, right? You can't do all the operations with as much freedom as you can do matrix multiply. You can do that in any order you like. And so there's an extra lower bound that says no matter how you reorganize LU or QR, the product of the latency and the bandwidth is at least n squared. So if we make the bandwidth go down, which we did to get these speed up, the latency has to go up by the same factor. So, and we attain that, that new lower bound. So it's good news and bad news. OK. So any questions about matrix multiply? Yes? Yeah, so I'm kind of used to the big O notation. Yes. <laughs> now you are talking about the lower bound, the omega. Yes, that's big O upside down. Yes. I want to make sure I understand it correctly. So, so for all these different uh, implementation algorithms, for matrix multiplication, it's still big O and Q. 
these are all, yeah, I was talking about the, the classical algorithm. We can do Strassen uh, as well, but all of this yes. so far has been order in cube classical yes. stuff. But now you are just trying to hit the lower bound. Right. I mean, I'm trying to leave out all the constants here because, you know, I only have an hour. <laughs> I can tell you what all the constants are. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so in your model uh, where you have uh, the number of words moved, but, um, that model assumes an L1 and an L2 cache. So, well, so the, in the case of, let me go back to... Uh, so in this case, um, I was counting the number of words that moved over that particular wire. And in that case, M in the bound was the size of whatever cache that is. So if, you want, if I have many levels of cache, like let's say I had three levels, I could sort of draw a line in there anywhere I wanted and, and use as the size of M either the size of the L1 or L1 plus L2 or whatever. And I can tell you how much data has to move over every wire. Yeah, so it all applies recursively in that sense. Yes? Um, so my question is, if you have a situation where now you want to do A times B times C, so you're nesting matrix multiplications, um, does the optimal way to do it end up being B times C with these algorithms? What depends on their uh, relative dimensions, of course. Are you assuming if, because if one's much taller and skinnier, you may want to put the parentheses in one place versus the other. So, but let's assume we've done that correctly. Then, then it says, yes, you can't do any better than just do one matrix multiply followed by the other matrix multiply. Yes, it does apply. So now let me go on to QR, which involves a new data structure and a new kind of algorithm. So let me uh, illustrate how to do this by doing a tall, skinny QR on a matrix, which fits where I have you know, many more rows and columns, and I have four processors. And so you know, processor zero owns the first n over four rows and so forth. So here's how the algorithm is going to work. Each processor independently, without talking to the, any of the others, does a local QR decomposition, right? So no communication at all. What I notice now is what have I computed? I've implicitly computed, factored my matrix W into the product of two matrices, this block diagonal orthogonal matrix consisting of all those orthogonal matrices times a stack of four triangles, four R's. Now, of course, I don't want four triangles. I want one triangle, but I've made progress. Then I take that stack of four triangles, I pair them up, and I do a QR decomp. Now I have to communicate these guys on the same processor, and I do a QR decomposition of them. And what I've done is Im I've implicitly factored this stack of four triangles into this block diagonal orthogonal matrix times half as many triangles as before. One more step, I take the last two triangles and factor them as Q times R. And I claim that I'm done. What I've done is I've factored my original matrix into the product of that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times R. That is a QR decomposition, because the product of orthogonal matrices is orthogonal. It's just a different data structure than we've had before. And so my output is basically a list of all of these different uh, Q matrices. Okay, so that is the, how the algorithm works in the case of parallel. So let me uh, summarize that in one slide, or in one little picture here. All I've done is I've called MPI reduce, where my reduction operation is a QR decomposition. I just take every pair of triangles and do a reduction, and I eventually get R out th at the top. And I save the Qs as I go. So that's the optimal parallel algorithm. I've done a single reduction, touched all the data once. So what about the sequential case? It turns out it's exactly the same algorithm. I just use a different shape reduction tree. So here's the optimal sequential algorithm. Suppose my matrix is too big to fit in cache, fits in DRAM, but I can fit a quarter of the matrix in cache at a time. So I bring in the first n over four rows, do QR. Then I bring in the next n over four rows, stack R on top of W, do another QR decomposition, read in the next n over four rows, and so forth. So I read the entire matrix from slow to fast memory once, and I get the QR decomposition. What if I have a more interesting architecture? You know, maybe I have a dual core machine. So I'll read in two, do the parallel decomposition, then I read in the next and read in the next. You know, but what if I have a real computer? You know, it's multi-core and multi-socket and multi-rack and multi-site and all of this. And I don't know until I actually get my allocation what I have. I'll just choose the reduction tree dynamically. So whatever hardware I have, I can choose this to minimize communication. 
I will get a different data structure, I, you know, but it's still the right answer. I just have to deal with that. So um, let me uh, now show you some more performance data. So here's some of the speed ups we've gotten on, on different platforms. So on an Intel Cloverton, we got an 8x speed up over the previous best algorithm. On a Pentium 3 cluster, 6.7x. On a Blue Gene, this was 4x on 32 processors, 13x on a GPU. This was an interesting one. This was the data was spread out over four different computers in four different French cities connected over the internet. And so you can imagine there's some, some latency costs going between different cities. And, and so here it was exactly four times faster than having all the data on, on one city. So it sort of completely erased the uh, latency costs. And for cloud computing, you can all you know, build this using, we used MapReduce you know, in, in the usual cloud architecture. And it was, only, it was almost optimal in the sense that the, the fastest you can do is do two map reduces, and uh, one to do the reduction, the other one to collect the cues. And, and it was a, within a factor of 1.6 of sort of the lower bound of two calls to map reduce. But the best speed up we ever got was infinite. So, so how do you get an infinite speed up? So the student who was implementing this was doing it on his laptop. And it was so big when he used the classical QR algorithm, it was, it, the, the matrix was not memory resident, it was sitting in, on disk. And so he was thrashing the disk, and he finally said the heck with it, you know, and hit control C. So, and compared to that, <laughs> um, it was only, when he ran the new algorithm, it was, and it was still, you know, had to go to the disk, it was only, it was within a factor of two versus uh, as though he had infinite DRAM. So it almost entirely hid the, all the, all the disk accesses too. So, and I should say, if you have a tall, skinny matrix and you want to do not just QR, but the singular value decomposition, which is pretty common, you get the same speed ups, because what do you do? You do QR, and then you just do the SVD on the little R factor. So you get all those speed ups happen there, too. And uh, this won another best paper prize. Okay. So let me just sort of summarize some of the related work. We've done all of this work for the BLAS, for you know, symmetric and definite factorizations, QR with pivoting, lots of other pivoting schemes, eigenvalue problems, you know, certain kinds of sparse matrices. It depends very much on the sparsity structure. All pairs, shortest path, and so forth. It works on a lot of different uh, platforms. There's you know, a lot of work to do there. And as I mentioned, this also, uh, in particular, my former student, uh, Edgar Solomonic, who's now at UIUC, spent a lot of time making this work for tensor contractions. And he built something called the Cyclops Tensor Framework, which has now been integrated into many different quantum chemistry codes that, uh, that use these ideas, as well as taking advantage of all the symmetries. OK. So that, uh, and let me just say it all works for Strassen, too. But I'm not going to go into any more detail in, in all of those fast algorithms. That's more fun for theory, I would say. Any questions about linear algebra before I claim that this works for anything? OK. So if you had infinite DRAM, um, then the traditional algorithms are faster? Com compared to Strassen? Compared to your, your, uh, your method, so So, so, um, so uh, you're saying when does ours win and when does the traditional one win? Yeah. So um, if communication, so, so 2.5D has your traditional one as a special case, right? And so what you would do is a performance model that says, is it worth having extra memory? Uh, you know, is that going to pay off? It may or may not. If it's completely flop dominant, then it may, you know, it, it may not benefit you. So that's a tuning parameter, how many copies that you have. So uh, yes? So which of these algorithms are currently in LaTeX or ScalaTeX? So, so that, uh, getting this in, in there is a sort of a longer software engineering process. So we recently released Tall Skinny QR. We have, um, uh, let's see, and, and so uh, that's the most recent release. I'd have to go look at the, uh, at the long web pages we have of, of releases. Um, so the next thing we're hoping to do is um, the, uh, so as I said, the, uh, Output of tall skinny QR is this different data structure. In order to incorporate that in all the other routines in LAPAC and ScalaPAC, we need to convert that data structure to the traditional one, which is a bunch of householder vectors. And that's sort of the next thing on, on, on the programmer's to-do list. So that, that's the current state. OK, so let's go beyond linear algebra. So I'm going to, I have to introduce some, uh, you know, to generalize this, I'm going to go back to matrix multiply and just introduce the notation to generalize it. So here's the naive code again, which I've already shown you. Here's the block code again, which I've already shown you. And the theorem, again, which I've already shown you. 
is that how do I pick the optimal block size? I take the, you know, the cache size, the fast memory size, I take its square root, and that attains the lower bound, which is the number of flops divided by the square root of the, ca of the cache size. So the question is, where does this magical one half come from? So let me write down the general theorem, not the most general theorem, to say where all these one halves come from. So all I need to know about this algorithm, there's the three nested loops, I'm going to record in this little three by three matrix, which records which arrays have which subscripts. So there's going to be one row for each array, ABC, in the inner loop, one column for each subscript, IJK, and a one indicates that A has I as a subscript, it does not have J, but it has K. So it's a simple little three by three matrix. Then what I go on and do is I solve a little three by three linear program which says please maximize the sum of these three numbers subject to this matrix times that vector is less than or equal to one. And the output happens to be one half, one half, one half, and the value of the linear program is three halves, which I'm gonna give a special name S sub HBL. HBL are the initials of three very famous mathematicians who sort of, you know, pure mathematicians who got all this started. I'll t you can guess who they are, but I'll tell you in a few slides. And so finally, what does the theorem say? It says that no matter how you reorganize this code, the lower bound on the number of words moved is the number of flops divided by the fast memory size to the power solution of the linear program minus one. So that's where that one half comes from. How do you attain it? You need to tile the loops. What's the optimal tile size? It's the solution of this linear program. So what's the intuition behind this? What this linear program is saying is that I need to I want to maximize the amount of work that I do. That's the product of these tile sizes. But the, I have to limit how much data I have, so that's the sizes of the A tile, the B tile, and the C tile. So what I'm, and what I'm doing is, the, so the sizes of the tiles are of the form m to the one, m to this power times m to that power times m to that power. So by taking logarithms, it all turns into a linear program. So I want to maximize the sum of these guys, but I want xi plus xj to be less than one, so a fits in memory and so forth. Okay, so now let me apply the same theorem to the direct and body algorithm and see what it tells us there. So now I just, this is simpler, I have two nested loops, I have a, an array of particles, you know, p1 through pn, I'll take all the pairs of particles, compute some force function, update f sub i. I'll do the same trick, I'll have a little matrix where I record which array has which subscripts, and since P appears twice, it, I get two rows in the matrix. Since PI has I as a subscript and PJ has J as a subscript. I'll solve the same little two by two linear program. And now the lower bound says that I have to move at least N squared divided by M to the first power number of words. So this is even better than matrix multiply because you know, M to the first power is much bigger than M to the one half. And it's attained by block sizes, just M by M. So all of those, and so this has been known for a while. But what it tells us is we can do that same trick, which I call 2.5D matrix multiply. We can apply it now to the n body code, because we can do that in total generality. So here are the speed ups we get by applying that trick of, of you know, making extra copies of the data like I did in matrix multiply. And we get up to 11.8x uh, speed ups. So what I've done here is I've taken 32,000 particles. I've spread them out over 8,000 cores. So each core only gets four particles, so it's, you'd think it'd be completely communication dominated. And indeed, if I only have one copy of the data, the green bar, which is time, completely dominates the computation time, which is red, so it's terrible. But if I have two copies of the data, or four copies of the data, the communication almost completely goes away, so I get perfect strong scaling. So this is the simplest case where I'm taking every pair of particles and doing it, but as you may well guess, that's sort of redundant work, right? Because I, you know, PI and PJ is the same as PJ and PI, so I, I don't want to do all of that. And so we've gotten all that to work too, and it's because people want to do not just two-body interactions. In physics and chemistry, they want to do three-body interactions and higher-body interactions, for which you can't use algorithms like fast multiple, you have to use a direct algorithm. And so all of it extends to that case, and, but there, if, you, if I have three body interactions, you can get down to one sixth of all the work because IJK is the same as KJI and so forth. And so you can get all of this to scale perfectly. And these are just sort of pictures of which subsets of the three dimensional space you want to work on. So as I mentioned, you know, people want to do n body problems in all sorts of cases where you still have to do the direct algorithm. So here's some applications. Some of them are familiar. 
I mean, we all know you need this for gravity and turbulence and molecular dynamics. I had a colleague uh, in, in the EE department who used it for electron beam lithography simulation. But here's one that you may be unfamiliar with, which is hair. So if you've ever uh, gone to a Disney movie and watched uh, Princess Merida, and she you know, jumps around and her, shakes her head, and she has long hair and it all bounces around, they're doing real-time simulation of, of uh, hair simulation as an end-body problem. And I know this because Kathy Yellick, who, who did this work, one of her students spent a summer at Disney, and he wrote all the code, and it's now used in you know, every Dis Disney movie that has Princess Merida shaking her head around. And, and one thing he learned is that if you're only there for three months, you don't get screen credit. But, you know, that's all right, so. Okay. So now, let me say how this generalizes to arbitrary code. And so let's suppose, so here's the, and this was originally done for matrix multiply using a special version of this very general uh, mathematical result. So let's suppose that I can somehow magically bound the amount of useful work I can do given that I'm only allowed to have m words of data, right? So I have you know, these big matrices. I'm only allowed to have some subset of m words of, of entries of a, b, and c. How much useful work can I do? And let me suppose I can get that upper bound g. And so that tells me that in order to do a total number of operations, f, which may be n cubed, I need to fill the fast memory f over g times. Because every time I fill it up, I can only do g pieces of work. And so the number of words moved is the number of times I fill up memory f over g times the cost of filling the memory. That's m. So the, it's a little more formal than that. But the hard part here is how do I get an upper bound on how much useful work I can do if I'm only allowed to have m words of, uh, of, of data? And to attain the lower bound, I need to sort of you know, figure out a tiling to actually break down my set of all possible things to do so that I can actually do g operations in every chunk of m words that I move in. OK, so let me uh, tell you what the, no I'm, I'm not going to prove this. I'm just going to tell you enough notation to explain it. So there is matrix multiply again, my three nested loops. And the, the way to generalize this is what am I doing? I'm iterating over some triples of integers, i, j, and k, in some subset of triples of integers, in this case, an n by n by n cubed, but it could be anything. And all I need to know about this code is what data it's accessing. One array is subscripted by ij, another one by ik, and another one by kj. That's all I need to know. So what's the general case? I could have as many loops as I want. They can have, you know, they can, they don't have to be, uh, you know, from one to n. They can be whatever they want. I can have as many arrays as I like, as many lines of code as I like. I can have as many subscripts as I like, and they can be arbitrary linear combinations of the loop indices. And you know, they can, I can have pointers and all of that. So how do I generalize this? I'm iterating over some you know, subset of k tuples of integers. That's my iteration space. And I'm accessing locations, which I just make a list of all these subscripts. And to give you a sense of what the mathematical tools are, I'm going to call them group homomorphisms, because it takes group theory to do this. So I just make a list of all these subscript expressions. And my goal is to have communication lower bounds and optimal algorithms for any code that can be expressed in this abstract form. So you know, any you know, number of loop indices, any subscripts that you like. And so let me just tell you what the answer is without trying to do the proof. So, given the, th so the theorem says that given any program that looks like that, there's a magical exponent so that the number of words moved is lower bounded by what we've seen before, the number of loop iterations, n cubed for matrix multiply, divided by m to this magical exponent. And how do you get that magical exponent you solve a linear program. And the linear program you know, requires you know, some inequalities that you know, involve all subgroups over, uh, under addition of k tuples of integers. So I should tell you who the, this was a, depends on a recent result in pure mathematics by my colleague and collaborator, Michael Chris, Terry Tao at UCLA, who's a very pure mathematician, and some other folks. But it goes back to some other work by uh, HBL. Who, who are they? H stands for Holder. You may have heard of Holder's inequality. He preceded you know, Cauchy-Schwartz. And then uh, BL or Brasskamp and Leap, who were pure mathematicians at Princeton in the, in the 70s. So it all goes back to that. And what we just proved much more recently is this lower bound is always attainable. There is a loop tiling that will always hit this lower bound. So now you might say, are we all done? Uh, is there anything left to do? Well, there are some assumptions. Uh, 
remember, I may have to reorganize your code, do it in a different order. And that means I have to respect the dependencies in your code. Like if I'm doing LU, I can't do it in an arbitrary order. And I'm assuming that my tiling fits you know, in your loop bounds, right? So for example, matrix vector multiply, you could think of as a special case of matrix matrix multiply. It's if one of the loop bounds is one, right? Because it's a vector. And so I can't tile that. I can't fit my nice cubic tile in that space. The lower bound applies, but it's not attainable. So let me just give you one example where uh, we have extended this recently, and that's to convolutional neural nets. So we have a new lower bound and optimal algorithm for this. We haven't actually run it yet, but we just finished the theory. So what's a convolutional neural net do? I have a whole, I have a whole bunch of, let's say, images of size you know, h by w, and I have a whole bunch of channels, so colors, say, you know, red, green, blue. So what am I going to do? I want to compute, convolve all of these with a filter. So what's a filter? It's a little r by s by c uh, brick, and what I want to do is take the dot product of all these numbers with all of these numbers by shifting it around. And I don't have just one filter, I have k filters. And so when I'm done, I'm going to be shifting this guy around, taking those dot products, and I'm going to end up with an h by w and then k output vector. So that's the simplest thing that you could describe a neural net doing. Now, I don't have just one image, of course. I have lots of images, so I have b copies, but they all share the same filter. And so when I write this all down, I get seven nested loops. And it's, it looks a little bit like matrix multiply, except it's a convolution, so the subscripts are not quite so simple. Now, in practice, I don't just shift this over by one and do it again by one and do it again. I shift it over by some shift, sigma w. So all of these things get moved over, so I have this shift there too. And so this, these seven nested loops are what I would like to have a communication optimal algorithm to do. And so we just proved this very recently. So let me let n be the product of all those seven loop iterations. That's how much work I have to do. And m is a cache size. And so let me write down the lower bound. It turns out it's the maximum of five different terms, because this is a much more complicated uh, arrangement, because I have to have something that's true no matter all what all these different sizes are. It could be that any one of these, you know, one could be large, one could be small. And so the first three terms are pretty natural. They're just the size of the output and the size of the input. I clearly have to read and write, you know, read each input once and write each input once. Here's the next term, the max. It, the lower bound, if I apply my theory, it turns out to be n body. So you can do much, much faster than matrix multiply in principle. It's really like the n body code. So it's a number of iterations divided by the cache size to the power one. But the trouble is I can't attain that uh, typically because I, my tile would be much, much bigger than my loop bounds in practice. So there's one more lower bound, which is, I'm not going to try to explain it, but it's sort of you know, matrix multiplied divided by something else. And so that's the new lower bound. And it, turn, and, and it turns out, depending on the, on the shapes and sizes of your neural net, any one of these may be the biggest. So I need all five terms in there. And so I can, this beats matrix multiply by this factor. And it applies in the common case when the data does not fit in the cache, but one filter does. OK. So that is our complicated new lower bound. And so we tried to write down a linear program again to attain it. And I'm pleased to say that one of my, another one of my wonderful students realized that you couldn't do it by hand. We did try. So he, because it's a parameterized linear program that depends on all of those loop bounds, so he wrote a program in Mathematica and, and uh, turned into 200 special cases for each one of which he generated uh, optimal code. So, <laughs> so this is something that can be done, uh, but we haven't actually gotten it running yet to know what the speed ups are. OK, so uh, this is the end of the second part of the talk. Uh, it, we're going to, you know, so what are we doing? We're you know, working on this to get optimal algorithms for arbitrary code that looks like nested loops. We're dealing with a case when the optimal tile is you know, too large to use, and so that's why we got it to work convolutional neural nets. We'd like to deal with dependencies more generally. We know how to extend the perfect scaling idea of 2.5D matrix multiplied to some of these, but we haven't done it for everything yet. And ideally, we don't want every programmer to have to know all the group theory and everything else that you need to apply, the, apply this. Only the compiler writers need to learn it and put it into the compilers. So that would hopefully be a collaboration going forward. OK. That's the end of the second part of the talk. You can erase your minds now, flush your caches, and we're going to move on to Krilov subspace methods. But any questions before then? OK, 
So what I now want to do is talk about minimizing communication for iterative solvers. For, you know, imagine you're solving AX equal B for a big sparse A or AX equals lambda X. What's the bottleneck for these algorithms them doing K sparse matrix vector multiplies with A in some starting vector? And there's a whole al long alphabet soup of different algorithms like that. And so the question is, how do I minimize the communication here when if I just, you know, I want to do better than K sparse matrix vector multiplies where I have to read the matrix K times. So let me assume, to, to make this a little bit easier to understand, that my matrix is well partitioned. So think of finite element matrix, but it's more general than that. So in the serial case, what would the conventional algorithm do? I take K steps. That means that I have to read my big sparse matrix into from slow memory to fast memory K times, and so the cost would grow like order K. It turns out I can do it once and take K steps. I can read my big sparse matrix from slow memory to fast memory once and take K steps. So that's a lower bound. What about the parallel case? What would the conventional algorithm do? I would do k sparse matrix vector multiplies. After each one of those, I need to compute some dot products, you know, some vector norms, stuff like that. And so it would cost log p messages for each of those reductions k times. Now I can do k steps with one reduction, and, or order one reduction. And that's you know, a lower bound, because you have to do at least one reduction. So there's lots of speed up possible, uh, both modeled and measured. So there is a little price I pay. I'm going to do some extra flops, some extra redundant work to make this work. But flops are cheap. That's the whole point. So I don't mind doing that. And uh, there's some other interesting uh, problems. What if your matrix is hard to partition? I'll show you a picture. How do you deal with preconditioners? We have some, but you know, in general, they're hard to do. And I'll show you some difficulties with numerical stability, which we can sort of get around. So uh, to give you the basic idea, I'm going to try the simplest thing possible. I'm going to show you how to compute ax, a squared x, dot, 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 up to a to the kx, and touch the matrix a once. And I'm going to show you that for a very simple sparse matrix. I'm going to a tridiagonal matrix. It's so simple I can show you every last detail. But the, the ideal will generalize. So I have a 32 by 32 tridiagonal matrix. So I'm given the vector x, those 32 dots. I want to compute those 32 dots, ax, a squared, and a cubed. So since my matrix is tridiagonal, I can tell you what the dependencies look like. To compute that entry of AX, I need those three entries of X, right? Because it's tridiagonal. And because, and to make the art a little bit simpler, I'm just going to color that in. So everything at the peak of the triangle depends on everything at the base of the triangle. So this tr dependency repeats itself everywhere. So if I want to compute that particular entry of A cubed, I need those three entries of A squared. And eventually, going down, following the dependencies, I need all those entries of X. And I don't want to compute just one entry of A cubed. I want to compute a bunch. So this is sort of the general dependency graph. So to compute all those entries of A cubed, I eventually need all those entries of X. So now, let me suppose that I can only fit about a quarter of my matrix into fast memory at a time. What am I going to do? In the first step, I'm going to read in the first quarter of the entries of X, the first quarter of the rows of A. And then I have all the data that I need to compute everything in that uh, uh, trapezoid, OK? So, and then I write out the answer, and I'm done. So then what I do is I read in the next quarter of the uh, entries of rows of A and the next quarter of the entries of X. But I need to save a little bit of information. To get that guy, it depends on those two blue ones. So I will save sort of these two ghost zones. But then I have everything I need to compute everything in the red, parallel pipe, uh, red uh, parallelogram. Then I can do the green parallelogram. And finally, the uh, yellow trapezoid. And I've touched every entry uh, exactly once. So that's the sequential algorithm. What about the parallel algorithm? Suppose I have four processors, and each one is going to be responsible for computing a quarter of the entries of a cubed x. And uh, here, are the, here are the partitions. So that means that processor 2 eventually depends on everything down here. So what would the traditional algorithm do? It would do one message to get that entry to there, another message, and, and three messages. So what I'm going to do instead, I want to minimize the number of messages. So I'm going to package up all three numbers here and send them in one message to pr to pr from processor 1 to processor 2. And I'll similarly package up all three of these and send it. So, so the, the latency will go down from 3 to 1. And 1 is a lower bound. But th what that means is that these red triangles are going to be computed redundantly. This red triangle will be computed both by processor 1 and processor 2. But flops are cheap. This is sort of an asymptotically smaller thing happening on my boundaries, so I don't mind doing that. And so the general picture looks like this. 
processor 2 you know, will compute everything in that trapezoid, and all these triangles are computed redundantly. And when n over p is large, these triangles are very, very small. So that's the tridiagonal case. What about a general sparse matrix? So it's going to be very much the same idea. So suppose I have a sparse matrix, which I'm going to represent here as a graph. So every vertex is a row or a column. And every edge is a non-zero. So this is a symmetric matrix here. So th if this is uh, um, vertex i and j, that means a sub i j is 0. And I've somehow partitioned the matrix by running a graph partitioner. And so the dotted lines indicate that. So I want to compute ax, a squared x, and a cubed x for everything that this processor owns. So what does it need to compute AX? Follow out the edges, one. It needs all those red uh, pieces of data in order to compute AX. Follow out the edges, one more link, and I, that's what I need to compute A squared X. One more link, and that's what I need to compute A cubed X. And so it's, this is how you generalize the tridiagonal case. And so what I need to do is basically two steps of breadth first search to get to A cubed. And that tells me what I need to send. So how do I do the partitioning? Well, that's graph partitioning, or actually hypergraph partitioning is a, is a better way to do this. And then in the sequential case, I have to decide what order do I want to execute all these in to minimize it. In the, in the tridiagonal case, I went from top to bottom, and now it turns into the traveling salesman problem, you know, a, a low-dimensional traveling salesman problem. So you can solve that one, too. So that's how we're now going to get this. I can compute all these matrix vector, multi uh, matrix vector multiplies in sort of with minimal communication. So let me sh now, but that's you know, not a Krilov subspace method, that's just a piece. So let me tell you how to use that to uh, uh, accelerate GM res. Now, what does GM res do? It says, I want to take you know, k steps of this algorithm, and I want to find the x in the span of all these vectors, which minimizes the residual of, you know, of my problem, ax minus b. Now, the thing is, these are not the same vectors that the original GM res algorithm would compute. Here's the original GM res algorithm. It does a matrix vector multiply. It runs modified Gram-Schmidt to make that vector orthogonal to all the ones it's computed already. And then it does some scalar operations. And when it's done, it solves a little k by k least squares problem to get the solution. So that's the original GM res. What am I going to do instead? I'm going to compute this, all these vectors using this uh, matrix powers kernel, which I'm calling that here. These are not the same vectors that you get over there, but they span the same space. So mathematically, they have the same information in it. I still want an orthogonal basis. How do I do that? I'm going to use tall skinny QR, which I already told you about. So I get Q. And the, so these vectors and these V vectors are, you know, serve the same mathematical purpose. I can rebuild the same H matrix, and I can solve the least squares problem. And so in the sequential case, I've decreased the number of words moved by a factor of K. Yes. I have a question about the modified GMRS to the right. Yes. So if you have already computed the Q and the R, why do you want to reconstruct the upper assembler matrix? Can't you just use the R to solve the discrete problem? I, I still need the H matrix to the, the up, it's a little k by k upper Hessenberg matrix that, that comes from solving the least squares problem. Um, and so that's, so I, so I still have to go back to, get to, to do that. And that it's a sort of a trivial amount of extra work. And in the parallel case, I've also decreased the number of messages by a factor of k. But, and, and so in exact arithmetic, everything's wonderful, but there's a terrible bug in this code in floating point. Does anybody see what it is? So what, am, what is this thing called here? This is called the power method. <laughs> I'm computing, so all these vectors, what are they doing? They're getting more and more nearly parallel to one another. And, they're, and to what vector? The vector corresponding to the dominant eigenvector. Okay. So if all of these vectors are parallel to one another, something's going to go wrong. It's a terrible numerical basis. But let me just go see what happens anyway. Let me run an experiment. So here is the original GM res algorithm, the convergence plot, iterations versus the relative norm of the residual on a log scale. So this is what classical GM res would do. Here's the algorithm I just showed you. Here's its convergence plot. Right? So, <laughs> so you can see it's complete noise. Uh, I'm calling this the monomial basis, because what am I doing? I'm computing AX, A squared X, A cubed X. Those are monomials in the, in the matrix X. But I don't have to use monomials. I can use other polynomials. And if I choose the right set of polynomials, it works just fine. So instead of computing A, A squared, A cubed, I just have to take the right linear combinations, and then it all works just fine. And I get a nice, well-conditioned basis. So part of the art in partial science in this business is picking the right polynomials. So here's some of the speed-ups that we got 
for making this work. And so um, in this particular picture, uh, the, uh, it's all normalized to the time of the new algorithm. And the old algorithm is, is higher. That means how much slower it was. And so the old algorithm ran modified Gram-Schmidt, and it did matrix vector products. And how did that improve? Um, it shrank down to the matrix powers kernel. So the blue shrank to the red. That was getting the sparse linear algebra faster. And the purple shrank to tall skinny QR and some, blo some block gram Schmidt, so the yellow plus the orange. And so the dense linear algebra got a lot faster too. And depending on your problem, you know, it was either the dense or the sparse linear algebra. So I should say that when we were originally working on this, I had one student tuning the sparse linear algebra, another student tuning the dense linear algebra. They put their codes together to build GM res, and it slowed down dramatically. It was terrible. And what we realized was the two kernels, the dense and the sparse, were fighting one another over the cache. So what we had to do is go back and co-tune the kernels, right? They had to be built, each realizing they only had a part of the cache to use, and then we got these speedups. So that means it's no longer necessarily possible to have independent tuning of sparse and dense kernels. You have to tune them together. So that was GM res. Now I'll just tell you, give you a little eye candy of what a BICG stab looked like. Yes? Um, so for GM res, um, the number of k iteration uh, depends on the convergence, so you can stop. That's a tuning parameter for sure. And so if I go back to this picture here, uh, I have k equal 5, you know, 15, 4. Those were chosen to sort of have optimal performance. So you don't know the k before um, one integer or so? Well, I mean, what you can do is try different values of k at the beginning and see which one works best and then tune it as you go along. So you, you might change k from iteration to iteration. Okay. Right. So in the case of BICG stab, here's the original code, just you know, to, to see what it is. And here's what it looked like when we finally turned into the communication avoiding version. So there's a lot more mathematics required here. Uh, and all of these matrix vector multiplies turned into three calls to matrix powers kernel to get that to work by both the matrix and its transpose. And all of these dot products turns in, turned into a matrix matrix multiply. Uh, instead of uh, uh, tall skinny QR. But uh, this gave great speed ups. And so here are s uh, the, uh, some convergence plots just to see what's going on. So here is when we use the monomial basis, and it was awful as we expected before. And here are two other bases, which are the uh, naive code and then uh, Newton basis and Chebyshev. And they all are converging at about the same rate, but they all give up. They all stop before they actually get to machine epsilon. So this was another stability problem. And we fortunately figured out that there is a way to fix that because what happens in BICG stab is it's computing, updating a residual and by keep continually subtracting vectors from it. And that can get out of line with what the true residual is. So every once in a while, you have to recompute the true residual. And then everything converges down to machine epsilon. So I'm almost done here. So we were using this as the bottom solver in a, um, in, in a, um, in a uh, geometric multigrid code. So this is the, uh, the mini GMG benchmark. It does the usual multigrid, and at the bottom, it does a bottom solve. Usually, you think of that as so small, you don't worry about it, but it's actually the dominant cost in a lot of applications. And they were using BICG stab for the bottom solver. We switched that to communication avoiding BICG stab, and that sped up the bottom solver by a factor of 4.2, and the overall uh, uh, geometric multigrid by 2.5x. And when this was put into two box lab applications for uh, Mach number combustion and n body uh, and gas dynamics, we also got good speed ups. So, since time is short, let me just say it all applies to machine learning. So, if you think about stochastic gradient descent, what do you do? You pick a vector you know, randomly, you, you do a descent in that direction, and you continue, pick another random vector. All of those Krilov subspace ideas apply, and we've gotten very large speed ups for everything, you know, including. You know, uh, you know, L2 minimization, L1 minimization, the lasso algorithm, uh, kernel methods, uh, sparse ve uh, support vector machines, we all get you know, order five speed ups for those as well. So let me just uh, skip ahead there. So we have new lower bounds, optimal algorithms, and big speed ups in theory and practice. Um, there's lots of work to be done here uh, in terms of you know, generating the you know, sparse matrix data structures automatically to recognize which polynomial bases to use. Um, we have different kinds of preconditioners that work. Um, you know, there's you know, sparse uh, approximate inverse preconditioners. There's hierarchically semi-separable matrices. Um, and there's more uh, extensions to uh, machine learning that are possible. So 
I won't go into too much detail here. On modern architectures, you've got to pay attention to those. Writes and reads do not cost the same. With, uh, you know, with non-volatile memory, writes can be much more expensive than reads. So we've, ext we've extended all this theory to separately minimize writes as opposed to reads. And sometimes we can do many fewer writes than reads. And so that's a whole nother top talk. And earlier today when there was a talk on MPI and, you, and it, was, you, it was said you could just call MPI reduce and you, your operations had to be associative, well, floating point addition is not associative. Uh, you get different answers. And we have figured out a way to make uh, addition associative again. And the IEEE floating point committee just voted a new instruction uh, that we proposed to help make uh, floating point addition associative again. And so now we have a new way to do reductions that you know, guarantee reproducibility. That's another talk. Okay, so this is uh, work by you know a large number of people. You know, I, I've been trying to give a survey. So these are the folks who you know either just recently graduated or are still working at Berkeley. Let me just mention, in particular, the co-leader of our group, Kathy Yellick, with whom I collaborate very closely, both on avoiding communication and raising two children, which sounds like a contradiction. You just have to be careful what kind of communication you avoid. So, yes. <laughs> And then lots of students and former students and people at other universities and lots of funding agencies. And so thank you all very much. So, Has anybody in your group started looking at uh, communication avoiding geometric multigrid algorithms as well? So uh, the best, so, um, so one thing that where you can do that is in the uh, smoother, smoothing operations at each level, you can use all the ideas there to make the smoothers run faster. And the other idea was to use the, um, uh, make the, the bottom solver go faster, which I talked about. Um, there are some lower bounds that were proven a number of years ago, I think by, um, at MIT, maybe it was in um, Savan Toledo's PhD thesis uh, a while ago, where he did lower bounds for multigrid uh, and, and showed that you know, real asymptotic improvements are not possible, so it's just these pieces that are possible. I th but it's been a while since I've read his thesis, so you might want to look at that. Mm -hmm.